forward. Hello and welcome back to the second part of my video series on Final Fantasy Tactics. In the first video, we looked at the systemic causes which were built into the feudal order of Ivelisse, which led to the rebellion of Wygraf and the Corpse Brigade. In this video, we will be examining the structure, mythology, and function of the Church of Glabados within the broader narrative of Final Fantasy Tactics. We'll also explore how this can be shown to reflect a popular understanding of the function of the Church during the Middle Ages in Europe, as well as how the game examines and incorporates religious and anti-religious themes. My hope is that even if you aren't overtly familiar with the game, there will still be enough plot summary to fill in the gaps. As this will necessarily entail discussing significant plot points, this video will contain spoilers for the entirety of the game. As a reminder, I will be using the naming conventions in the War of the Lions version. Now, if you haven't played this game before, but you've been thinking about it, I implore you to stop watching this video and get yourself a copy. It's widely available on mobile platforms, and if, like me, you're not particularly fond of gaming on a mobile device, there are desktop options which will allow you to play on a PC. It's how I got all the footage you'll be seeing through these videos. Trust me when I say that going into Final Fantasy Tactics blind is the best way to experience the game. So, without further ado, welcome back to the struggle, comrades. Church of Glabados. So, to start our examination of the Glabadosian religion, we may as well start with the primary means by which the teachings of St. Ajora have been disseminated, the Church of Glabados itself. At the apex of the Church hierarchy is the High Confessor. During the timeline of the game, this office is occupied by Marcel Funebris. The unused job description reads as follows. A priest and prophet with ultimate power over the church. A word from him can sway the fate of entire nations. The next position in the church is the rank of cardinal. Again, at this period in Ivelisse history, the only cardinal you encounter is Alphonse Delacroix, who is also the liege lord of Lionel. His unused job description reads as follows. The cardinal's power in the church is second only to that of the high confessor himself. For those who haven't played the game, Cardinal Delacroix is revealed as the primary antagonist of Chapter 2 and uses the Scorpio Arasite to transform into the first Lukavi you fight, Quiklin the Impure. Beneath Cardinals you have Confessors, who are also part of the Office of Inquisition. Confessor Zalmor Lucinata, who your party encounters twice, according to his Personae entry, wields incomparable power both within and without the church, and no one, not even the knightly orders, can challenge his power. There are also some other functional roles of the church which are not categorized hierarchically. The character, Simon Penn Leish, is given the job of Elder, an elder of the church who never rests in his mission to spread the teachings of the gods to the common people. Simon is the head of Orban Monastery and, in the original PlayStation version, is listed as a bishop. He is also listed as a former inquisitor. Add to this would be priests, which have dummied profile images but are never used. During gameplay, enemy units which are among the forces of the church include knights, monks, white mages, mystics, orators, and geomancers. All in all, the Church of Glabados is organized with titles and authority very much in line with the real-world Catholic Church, i.e., in the original Japanese version, the High Confessor was listed as Pope. However, there are two additional branches of the Church, the Office of Inquisition and the Knights Templar, both of which bear further discussion. I'll only touch on it briefly, but as I've mentioned, the Office of Inquisition during the game is controlled by Confessor Zelmore. 
but the only other noted inquisitor is the Marquis de Limbury, whose persona entry for chapter 1 and 2 lists him as an ordained inquisitor. This tracks very well with the historic relationship between the clergy and the nobility. From a purely historical materialist perspective, the nobility and the clergy are essentially the same when it comes to the position they occupy in the feudal mode of production. In fact, in 15th century England, the vast majority of higher church positions were filled primarily by the families of noble houses, uh, who in turn also filled various government offices. The Templarate, more commonly referred to as the Knights Templar, act as the personal bodyguards to the High Confessor. They are also the military branch of the Church of Glabados, who, along with the paramilitary office of Inquisition, as discussed above, provide the real power behind the Church. One of the notable aspects of the Knights Templar is that, unlike the Office of Inquisition, they appear to recruit across class lines. This is something which I will be touching on later. For now, let us turn to look at the second component of the Glabadosian religion. The Canon One of the things which really makes Final Fantasy Tactics shine is, despite its sprite-based characters and simple renderings of three-dimensional environments, the level of detail which went into the world building. Take for example the primary symbol of the Church of Glabados, the T. Now, perhaps it was my own lack of insight upon playing it for the first time, uh, being more focused on the plot and mechanics, so I don't remember exactly when it was I realized the T was in fact a stylized gallows. Saint Ajora, the central figure of the Glabadosian religion, was executed by hanging after all, and there's even a symbolic reference to it at the Golgolata Gallows, where Princess Ovilia is allegedly to be hung near the end of Chapter 2. The game devs really leaned heavily into the Western European medieval feudal framing for their world building, and so Saint Ajora is supposed to be a very obvious Evelician manifestation of Jesus of Nazareth, right down to the symbol of the religion based on his teachings being his own means of execution. Now here's the interesting thing. While I adore the level of detail and thought which went into the world building, I do wish we learned more about the beliefs of the Church of Glavados, or even what the teachings of Saint Ajora actually were. See, Jesus' death and resurrection form the symbolic basis for Christianity as a whole. The problem of sin and the inaccessibility of the paradisical afterlife without the sacrificial offering of Christ's life for the redemption of humanity in the eyes of the Christian God, creates the basis for the worship of Christ. This is made into a religion through adherence to the teachings of Christ made manifest by his earthly representatives, at first his disciples, but gradually the Catholic Church. In the case of Saint Ajora, however, the basis for the deification of Ajora is his death and the disaster which occurred directly after it there doesn't appear to be any sort of teaching, any basis for the worship of Saint Ajora beyond the devs needing to create a not-Christian religion for their not-medieval England, which frankly is mostly fine, but I think it was a missed opportunity. Saint Ajora's mission, uh, based on the information we are given in the Persona entry and through the reading of the scriptures of Germany, simply state that he was an apocalyptic preacher and taught about the coming of paradise. As Ramza states, My faith in the Church of Glabados was not as profoundly complete as my brother Zalbog, yet I did believe that Saint Ajora was a child of the gods, descended from the heavens to deliver humanity from its self-inflicted chaos. Similarly, the earliest references of Saint Ajora's life had him, as an infant, worn of a poisoned well, after which people hailed him as a portent of miracles and a child of the gods. Saint Ajora's cult also incorporated the existing legend of the Zodiac Braves and had him collect the twelve Zodiac Stones and, with his disciples, defeat a demon which had been summoned by the King of Limbury. However, owing to his popularity, the Holy Adoran Empire and its religion of Pharism feared Ajora's growing influence and plotted to capture and execute him, which it did through his disciple, a Germanique. Ajora was executed at Golgolada, but the anger of the gods resulted in the sinking of Mulond, the center of Ferris teachings, 
Senajora was then said to have ascended to take his place among the gods. Unlike Christ, however, there is no salvific basis to Senajora's exalted status as a child of the gods, and so we are forced to ask ourselves, what is the basis of the Glabidosian religion? And the only reasonable answer that we can arrive at is that the religion of Ivalis, that taught by the Church of Glabidos, is power. Saint Ajora was worthy of his divine status because he was able to predict and potentially prevent disaster, utilize sacred artifacts to defeat an otherworldly demon, and ultimately call down the wrath of the gods to destroy his enemies, if at the cost of his life. This was why his followers took up his name and carried on his legacy, literally building the seat of the church on the ruins of the Ferris Temple on Milond. At least, this is the orthodox interpretation of events, because as it turns out, there were alternatives available. Heresy Ramza receives these scriptures of Germanique from the mortally wounded elder Simon after Alma is kidnapped midway through chapter 3. If you examine the book in your list of artifacts, you get the following description. A historical account of Saint Ajora's life recorded by his disciple, Germanique. Its very existence has long been denied. You are also presented with the option to read the text. It's a long text dump, so I'm not going to transcribe it here. Uh, the text starts off by providing the canonical life of Saint Ajora, including the role played by the supposed author of the account we are reading, Germanique. A Germanique, the Glabidosian version of the Christian Judas, was, according to the traditional telling, the disciple who betrayed Saint Ajora to his death. The scriptures reveal the historic Ajora was in fact a spy working for a rival state, sowing dissension to weaken the empire. Germanique himself was essentially Eudoran counterintelligence, and he revealed Ajora's true intentions. The text was clearly excluded from the Glabidosian canon and suppressed, but was discovered and translated by Elder Simon. The text itself is held to be heretical, but the implicit acknowledgement the game makes is that the church not only acknowledges its existence, but also knows it is true. It may be worth taking a step back for a moment to examine just what heresy was, and how someone could be labeled a heretic. A heresy was, usually, some theological argument made by an individual, who would almost certainly develop some kind of following, which was contrary to the established orthodoxy of the church. A heretic was someone who developed, believed, and spread these heretical teachings to the laity, but who could also influence the beliefs of the clergy. In 15th century England, the heresy of lollardry was a pressing issue, based primarily on the reformist teachings of the priest John Wycliffe. The lollards were a reformist movement who wanted to abolish the existing hierarchy of the church, divest it of its property, and generally argued for a more equitable state of affairs for the peasantry. As a direct material threat to the church, the lollards were censored and repressed, with some of them being excommunicated and a few even executed as heretics. While the label of heretic was absolutely used by the church to suppress its political opponents and maintain its own status, it wasn't typical to apply this label to someone who, say, killed a bishop. During the Peasants' Rebellion of 1381, for example, the peasantry killed the Archbishop of Canterbury, Simon Sudbury, while some were eventually executed for the crime, they weren't labeled as heretics. So, while labeling Rams a heretic is a convenient narrative conceit, since he doesn't actually preach against the Church of Glavidos, he really isn't committing any heresy. That is at least until he is in possession of the scriptures of Germanique, because if the game had him running around Ivalis, preaching Saint Ajora being a false saint, well, then you'd have a heretic on your hands. This is one of the narrative elements which I think the writers could have had Arislam lead into, to thematically show why Ramza was historically labeled as a heretic. As it stands, it would be truly bizarre for an institution like the Church of Glavidos to acknowledge the fact that its founding and central figure was a fraud. There's no reason for such a powerful societal organization to make such an admission, because it would be much easier to simply state that Germanique, who they already have established as a liar and traitor, 
created a false testimony to excuse his betrayal of Saint Ajora. In a really important note which can be easy to miss during the closing video of the game, we learn that Oren obtained the scriptures of Germanique and brought them before the Clemencian Council, which had convened to select the new High Confessor. The church, fearing the truth, confined Oren and had him burned at the stake for the crime of heresy. The scriptures of Germanique are once again suppressed, but still not destroyed, and are rediscovered by Arislam, who publishes about them as well as instigating his investigation into the events of the War of the Lions, establishing the framing device for the game. I'm going to leave this specific topic here though as I will be doing an entire video on the topic of historic revisionism. So let us now look at the theoretical basis behind the secret plot of High Confessor Funebris, the reason which he believes he can manipulate the nobility into starting the War of the Lions. The Opium of the Masses I've been doing my best to contextualize and historicize any modern references which might be out of place in Ivalis, but thanks to this little exchange with Mustadio, the existence of a drug trade focused on opium in Ivalis is canon. Later on, one of the feats you achieve for completing an errand during Chapter 3 references a cart transporting drugs being overturned, and as the chef's kiss, during the duel with Wygraf in the Ryovane's Keep, if you manage to hold out to trigger the secondary dialogue, you get treated to this choice quote. The reeking masses yearn for gods and miracles. It is their opiate, and they consume it greedily. So let's unpack the words of Marx being voiced by a former anarchist, now turned Lukavi. The title of the section and the quote Wygraf paraphrases is probably one of the most well-known phrases from the entirety of Marx's corpus. It also happens to be one of the most misunderstood, particularly among theists. This quote comes from the introduction to Marx's A Contribution to the Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right, and its full context reads as follows. Religious suffering is the sigh of the oppressed creature. Religion is the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. Now, it needs to be said that the period in which Marx is referencing is the modern era, the contemporaneously 19th century Europe, where the centrality of organized religion had itself become unmoored from its earlier manifestation as the primary justifying ideology of medieval society. If it isn't clear, the words which come from Wygraf's mouth are not the words of Marx, but rather the popular misunderstanding of what he was even on about. Marx's critique of religion engendered in this quote isn't about the inherent foolishness of the ignorant religious masses. It is rather a comment expressing a deep empathy for the plight of the people, the proletariat, those whose existence is so wretched, whose lives have been subsumed by the capitalist mode of production, that the best that they have come to believe they can hope for is a paradisical afterlife free from their temporal suffering. This was also the consolation promised for the life of toil and subjugation of the medieval peasant. Wygraf as Bellius's view, on the other hand, expresses the sneering contempt for the peasantry we've come to expect from the mouths of the nobility, not their former champion. This is the popular view of Marx's quote, and the inferred meaning is that religion is the thing of the craven masses, deluding themselves into a fantasy because of their own stupidity. The rhetorical difference between the original people versus the paraphrased masses is quite telling. You see, what opiate meant in the mid-19th century is quite different than what the same means today. While the hallucinatory properties were known, the addictiveness and chemical dependence habitual use could develop was not. Rather, opium was one of the most widespread medicines available, arguably comparable to the use of penicillin today. As such, the use of opium as a metaphor was in relation to its properties as a medicine and not as an addictive narcotic. Religion then, in Marxist analysis, serves as a component of the justifying ideology for whatever the dominant means of production was. The next section will explore the mythological basis which justify the tripartite division 
of medieval society into the three orders of peasant, clergy, and noble, so here I want to focus on the conciliatory aspects of medieval religion. The material conditions of feudalism were wholly dependent upon the exploitation of the peasant's agricultural labor. While the disdain for the peasantry was palpable across a wide span of medieval literature, so too was the acknowledgement that the upper classes were utterly dependent upon this labor to survive. With little recourse available to alter their station, the promise of some future reward for a life spent toiling for the profit of others had an immense appeal. Such assurances of heavenly respite were woven through the tapestry of medieval religion, and so was a refuge where the peasant could channel their hopes for a better future. In this way, not only could the peasant make sense of their place in the feudal hierarchy, the hierarchy itself was justified by the foundational mythology upon which the medieval worldview was built. While this underlying basis was foundational, it could nevertheless be manipulated to serve the needs of those in power. The Origin of Oppression In his seminal work Mythologies, the writer and literary critic Roland Barthes laid out his argument explaining how mythology works. His fundamental thesis was that mythology exists to establish a foundational justification for the existing power relations of a given culture or state. This could be further elaborated to create what amounts to an argument from nature that the existing social hierarchy is not only foundational, but the natural state of affairs. If we examine some of the arguments from medieval European history, we can observe how this process functioned historically. In the last video, I briefly touched on the famous line attributed to the radical preacher John Ball, recorded as one of the leaders of the Peasants' Rebellion of 1381. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman. Now, there is little historical basis to actually attribute this to John Ball, but at the end of the 14th century, the argument was a familiar one. According to the cosmogenic myth as laid out in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, when exiled from the paradise of Eden, were made to toil, but at no point did the Christian god establish the Lord Surf dichotomy. That would come later. According to Paul Freeman, in his text, Images of the Medieval Peasant, the biblical foundation for the subjugation of the peasantry and the institution of serfdom could be found in the story of Noah and his son Ham. In Genesis 9, 18-27, Noah, after planting a vineyard and creating wine, becomes inebriated and passes out while naked. His youngest son, Ham, discovers his father and goes to fetch his two brothers, Shem and Japheth. They walk backward to avoid seeing their naked father and cover him with a garment. Noah awakens and, angered by Ham's transgression at seeing him in such a state, curses Ham's son, Canaan. Noah's curse renders Canaan and his progeny to be in servitude to Shem, Japheth, and their progeny. During the Middle Ages, this passage would undergird the justifying ideology of the feudal state, being the subjugation of the peasantry as the productive engine driving the benefit of the higher orders of the nobility and clergy. This is precisely the function which Marx was referring to in his conceptualization of the base and superstructure. The feudal mode of production required the vast majority of the population of Europe to engage in agricultural and other forms of labor for the material benefit of the minority of aristocratic and ecclesiastical orders who ruled over them. To justify this ordering of society, and their own exclusion from engaging in this productive labor, the ruling classes needed to establish the historicity of this state of affairs to maintain their hegemonic control. By pointing to a specific biblical episode where the ultimate authority, in this case the Christian God, is the one who establishes this ordering of society, the ruling classes have their justification. The existence of a justifying ideology does not, however, preclude opposition to the existing order. Peasant rebellions were a relatively common occurrence throughout the Middle Ages, after all. I discussed the Corpse Brigade in my last video, but the antipathy of the peasantry did not die with them. Instead, the mantle of ending the subjugation of the peasantry is transferred to several members of the Knights Templar. Before Wygraf is transformed into the Lucavi Bellius, 
he is recruited into the ranks of the Templarate. As previously stated, one of the very distinct elements of the Templarate is that they do not appear to be beholden to class in the same manner the higher clergy and inquisitors were. In fact, the desire to bring an end to the existing hierarchical structure of Evelyssian society is the stated goal of several members of the order. Isolud, Barak, and Wygraf all state outright that their reasons for joining the Knights Templar and working in the shadows for the church is to establish a more equitable Ivalis by bringing an end to the rule of the crown and the aristocracy. Each of them also question why Ramza does not join their ranks to fight for a better future for the common folk of Ivalis. And up to their deaths, they are each of them true believers in the justness of their cause and righteousness of the High Confessor's plot. As we learn about the mythology of the Glabidosian religion, there must also have been some scriptural or doctrinal basis which was used to justify the existing social order. Mythology can, however, be a double-edged sword. The scripture which justifies subjugation can also be the basis for liberation. We are told that the reason that St. Ajora was hunted, tried, and executed by the Holy Udoran Empire was because he represented a threat to their rule. This is because, aside from his growing base of acolytes in keeping with his apocalyptic preaching, St. Ajorek spoke of the coming of paradise to the world. Somehow it doesn't seem like much of a stretch to see how an idealist like Wygraf could justify his support of the church as the temporal arbiters of the ultimately egalitarian will of St. Ajora. Wygraf, after all, understood what he lacked following the destruction of the Corpse Brigade, the means to bring about the change necessary to liberate the peasantry. Given the events which play out, however, the High Confessor's plot, the goals of the leaders of the War of the Lions, the Lukavi seeking to resurrect Ultima, Ram's actions, and Delita's schemes, we can begin to understand how the mechanics of the game reinforce an inescapable truth about what drives the world of Ivelisse. The Will to Power The concept of the will to power, or in the original German, der Will der Macht, was coined and developed by existentialist philosopher Frederick Nietzsche in his text, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. The underlying principle of the will to power is that it is the driving force of not only human development, but of life itself. The following portion of section 34 of the text, titled Self-Overcoming, is illustrative of the general concept. Only where there is life is there also will, not, however, will to life, but so I teach you, will to power. Much is reckoned higher than life itself by the living one, but out of the very reckoning speaks the will to power. Thus did life once teach me, and thereby, you wisest ones, do I solve you the riddle of your hearts. I say to you, good and evil which would be everlasting, it does not exist. Of its own accord must it ever overcome itself anew. With your values and formulae of good and evil, you exercise power, you valuing ones. And that is your secret love, and the sparkling, trembling, and overflowing of your souls. Here we have a fictionalized version of the Zoroastrian prophet Zarathustra, extolling his realization that what drives human striving is not virtue, nor the simple act of existing, but the drive to dominate. This text is also where Nietzsche developed his conceptualization of the Superman, the Übermensch. The Übermensch is Nietzsche's ideal human, an individual who's progressed past the pedestrian boundaries of common morality. Part 3 of the prologue of the text provides us with a clear conception. I teach you the Superman. Man is something that is to be surpassed. What have ye done to surpass man? When I said earlier that the religion of Ivelis was power, I was speaking figuratively, but when you consider the narrative of the game itself and what each antagonist is striving to achieve, the reality of this becomes clear. While there are allusions to Nietzsche sprinkled throughout the game, we are also forced to contextualize the narrative with the way the mechanics of the game actually allow the story to progress. 
Final Fantasy Tactics is, above all else, a tactical, turn-based JRPG. While it shares a considerable amount of similarities with the mainline Final Fantasy titles, it differs in significant ways. For starters, every battle has conditions which must be met to achieve victory, and in every case except one, the conditions are to kill every enemy on screen. Sure, there are mitigating conditions as well, primarily those where you need to ensure that a specific unit is not killed, and the single exception to the norm being releasing the locks on the Sluis Gate at Fort Besselet. Yet, in every case, you achieve this by killing either a specific unit or all units on screen. Secondly, Tactics is one of the only games in the series where you cannot flee from random encounters. Instead, you need to perform either a hard or soft reset to load a safe state prior to triggering the encounter. I can point to some unique means of ending random encounters without killing all the opponents, like using the Orator's Invite skill, but this can only be used during random encounters. All story battles can only be concluded by the elimination of all enemy units. As far as I know, the idea of pacifist runs hadn't really developed into a feature of game played during the production of Final Fantasy Tactics, so it's not surprising that this was the state of games more broadly. Nevertheless, that it wasn't considered an option definitely reinforces the idea that, regardless of the ethical reasonings Ramza uses to justify his actions, the only tool available to you, the player, to advance and complete the game, is violence. Fundamentally, owing to the linearity of game progression, you need to have your team either leveled high enough or with adequate job skills to defeat your opponents. The only means of achieving this during a normal playthrough is by engaging in both story and random battles. As you make your way through the game, you will begin to encounter stronger enemy and ally units, and many of them will be a special class of knights. Holy Knights, Divine Knights, and Sword Saint. The job description for Holy Knight and Divine Knight each emphasize their holy nature and association with the church, and these are essentially the most powerful job classes in the game. Take for example the character of Sidolphus Orlandu, aka TG Sid, who has access to all of the skills of the Holy and Divine Knights, as well as two from the Fell Knight job class, and has long been considered game-breaking. Therefore, Narratively and mechanically speaking, the game necessitates that you access the strongest characters and best equipment in order to advance to its conclusion. Again, nothing remotely revolutionary for a tactical JRPG, but when understood in the wider context of the game holistically, the mechanics reinforce the story incredibly well. The world of Ivalice is one where the powerful are able to thrive at the expense of the meager. In order to understand what this can tell us about the nature of religion and power in Ivalice, we must ask ourselves, what kind of god would allow this to happen? Killing God What precisely constitutes deity in the universe of Final Fantasy Tactics is unclear at best. In the original English translation, the devs went with the monotheistic conceptualization of deity, but in the War of the Lions version, they had decided to maintain the implied polytheism of the original Japanese script. Saint Ajora is described as a child of the gods, but is revealed to have been the host of the primary Lukavi, Ultima. When we consider that, aside from the resurrection of Malak, we never witness a single positive use of the Orosite during the game, one of the conclusions which we can arrive at is that the Lukavi are as close to gods as we ever encounter. When you fight and defeat the Lukavi, the constant refrain from each upon being mortally wounded is that they do not understand how it is they have been killed. Their expectation upon manifesting is that they are immortal, and their explanation for why they are nevertheless able to be killed is because Ultima has not yet been resurrected. As it happens, none of the Lukavi are ever incarnated while Ultima is resurrected, so this theory is never put to the test. Ultima herself, however, is also not immortal, and provided your team is highly leveled or your manner of play is sufficiently skillful, she can be defeated. Given that the game establishes that Saint Ajora is in fact Ultima, and that Saint Ajora is the closest thing the world of Ivalice has to a god, 
Ramza and co. effectively kill God. It would be an apt metaphor if it wasn't literally what happens, so let's unpack this idea a bit. Anyone who has spent much time playing through the collected works of Square Enix, who has paid even the slightest bit of attention, will be familiar with their general antipathy towards organized religion. Final Fantasy X and XIII both feature antagonists who are members of the established mainline religious institutions. Xenogears goes one step further, having your party actually fight God. So religion is typically portrayed as negative when it is part of the plot, and is a motif woven throughout the developer's oeuvre. Where Tactics differs is that it portrays both the structure of religious institutions and the gods themselves in a negative light. The Nietzschean conceptualization of the death of God is not, of course, a literal claim, but rather entails the supplanting of the axial position of religion in Western civilization following the Enlightenment. The text where the quotation first appears is The Joyous Science, published in 1882, in section 108 titled New Struggles, and more thoroughly in section 125, The Madman. I won't read the entirety of the section, but the pertinent portion follows. Where is God gone? he called out. I mean to tell you. We have killed him, you and I. We are all his murderers. But how have we done it? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the whole horizon? What did we do when we loosened this earth from the sun? Whither does it now move? Whither do we move? Away from all suns? Do we not dash on unceasingly? Backwards, sideways, forwards, in all directions? Is there still an above and below? Do we not stray as through infinite nothingness? Does not empty space breathe upon us? Has it not become colder? Does night not come on continually, darker and darker? Shall we not have to light lanterns in the morning? Do we not hear the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell the divine putrefaction? For even gods putrefy. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we console ourselves, the most murderous of murderers? The holiest and the mightiest that the world has hitherto possessed has bled to death under our knife. Who will wipe the blood from us? What lustrums, what sacred games shall we have to devise? Is not the magnitude of this deed too great for us? Shall we not ourselves have to become gods merely to seem worthy of it? There never was a greater event, and, on account of it, all those who were born after us belong to a higher history than any history hitherto. Sorry if that was a mouthful, but you really need to get the whole rant in order to grasp the illusions Final Fantasy Tactics makes towards it. Keeping with the tradition of multi-form final bosses, Ultima manifests in two forms, the first being the High Seraph, and the second being the Arc Seraph. The High Seraph appears as classically angelic, long flowing hair, feathered wings protruding from her back and head, draped in red and with relatively serene expression. Her iconography is strikingly similar to both Kefka from Final Fantasy VI and Safer Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII. When she's defeated, however, she reverts to her true form, the Arc Seraph. The Arc Seraph is larger, but gone are the feminine and angelic features, replaced with a decaying bat-winged corpse. The wings protruding from her head have been replaced with a bishop's mitre, and the red bodysuit has changed into a purple core, reminiscent of bishop's robes or cassock. Here is the final decaying form of the closest thing to a deity, an Ivelisse. Can you smell the divine putrefaction? Now, if you're ready for something really wild, the dummy job description for Ultima's initial job class, High Seraph, reads as follows. A being that has been set free from the laws that govern creation, surpassing pedestrian concepts of morality. Uh, given all this, it should be abundantly clear that the devs were, at the very least, familiar with some of the more famous passages of Nietzsche's work and incorporated these themes seamlessly into the narrative and even mechanics of the game. Ramza's final job class has been dubbed Heretic Ramza, 
but an older term for it among the fan community was Uber Squire. I think it would be a stretch to say that the fandom had the Nietzschean Ubermensch in mind, the more likely origin simply being that Uber has popularly become a prefix denoting power, but it needs to be noted that the term itself, a borrowing from the German, was popularized by the works of Nietzsche. It's also worth pointing out that, in keeping with the heretic theme, the final skill needed to master the job class is the Ultima spell, which of course can only be learned from a demon. Maybe Rams was more of a heretic than I originally gave him credit for. To tie this all back into the Marxist critique of religion then, as I've discussed, religion operates to justifying ideology for the dominant means of production, to provide a basis to naturalize and perpetuate that system. Insomuch as the capitalist mode of production cannot continue in the face of proletarian revolution and the coming of socialism, so too must the justifying ideology come to an end. This does not necessarily mean that religion in and of itself also must come to an end. Only religion as it exists as a component of the ideology of the ruling class. Just as the feudal mode of religion gave way to the capitalist conceptualization of the cosmos, so too must this religion give way to the proletarian future. In the final analysis, you have Ramza Biolv, disillusioned noble turned mercenary, accused heretic, fighting for the common good against the machinations of the nobility, the church, and even God herself. His quest for justice has him take up the mantle of radicals like Wygraf in defense of the common people against the powerful. Along the way, he uncovers not only the plot of the High Confessor, but discovers the secret history of Saint Ajora, causing him to lose his faith. For swearing the established hierarchies of both the aristocracy and the Church of Glabados, he manifests his own path, which has him attack and dethrone God. Uber Squire, indeed. Afterward. The script for this video has probably undergone the most revisions of any video I have made thus far, but I think I've still managed to establish a cohesive examination of the religious and anti-religious themes woven throughout Final Fantasy Tactics. Still, this leaves a lot of related content on the cutting room floor, so to speak. So I think in addition to at least two additional videos I have planned for this series, I might create a miscellany for some of the ideas I had which had to be cut for thematic or pacing purposes, but which I still think may be of interest. Uh, let me know what you think. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, and think it is merited, please give it a thumbs up. If you did not, please show your displeasure by giving it a dislike. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them below. As always, I post my sources in the episode notes, so if you want to follow up with your own reading, it's a good place to start. If you think anyone else you know might actually enjoy this video or others in the series, uh, please share it. It really does help the channel out. As always, if you like what I do and want to be updated whenever new content is published, subscribe to the channel. There should also be some links to other videos I've made uh, coming up. Thanks for your time.